and so forth. Um, so welcome everybody to, uh, let me see, this is the fourth in our summer speaker series. Uh, I'm Moira Yip, I'm a member of the program committee here at the library. I have two screens on my desk and I, I, my camera is on the bottom screen and the top screen is my big screen. So if you see me looking up, <laughs> it's because I can't keep my eyes off my big screen. Um, I have to find a better way to do this, but that's the way it works. Um, so we will be muting everyone during the presentation. And if you, a question comes to you while it's going on, you could either just hang on to it and ask it at the end, or you can type it into the chat and then we will read it uh, as the thing goes on. Um, so it gives me great pleasure this evening to welcome Sarah Lucchese, who is the um, Education and Outreach Director for Marine Mammals of Maine, which has an acronym, acronym M-M-O-M-E. And Sarah tells me that she thinks the acronym, acronym is longer than the name of the organization. So we're going to stick with Marine Mammals of Maine because I think she's right. Um, she has been working with them for four years in, uh, in Kennebunkport, but her day job is that she's a librarian at the University of Southern Maine. And she also has a master's degree in oceanography. So this is something she actually knows a lot about. And she's going to talk to us today about the whole organization for somewhere around 40 to 45 minutes. Uh, and then we'll have questions at the end. And I think we'll do it that way around rather than interrupting her presentation with questions. Okay, Sarah, you have the floor. All right, thank you so much, Moira. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen uh, and then I can get started. Well, thank you all for joining us this evening. We really appreciate um, that you're taking time out of your day to, to learn how to help the marine mammals of Maine. Um, in, in our work and, and help the seals themselves directly as well. Um, so just a little bit of background about the organization. Marine Mammals of Maine has been around. Um, it's actually a fairly uh, uh, new organization in the grand scheme of things. We've been around since about 2012. So when we first started out, we actually did not have a rehab facility. The, um, the only rehab facility in the state of Maine at that time was at the University of New England. And so what we would do is um, pick up seals that were stranded on beaches and, and it was determined that they needed care. And we would transport them to the University of New England as the only care facility in the state. Uh, in 2014, that organization very abruptly um, shut down. So the, the seal care organization there shut down um, with very little warning. And so for, for a few years after that, we had to transport any, uh, any animals that we picked up down to a facility in Massachusetts, that was the closest one. Um, and unfortunately, if, um, if we had, you know, seals that were in, you know, we, we, we pick up seals when it's determined that they're not going to survive on their own. Um, and so if you can imagine these seals are um, either haven't been eating, they're dehydrated, they are injured or sick. Um, and then if they have to drive, you know, two, two and a half hours down to Massachusetts, um, a lot of them were, were not surviving that journey. So what we ended up doing was getting just a, um, a short-term rehab license where we could keep animals in our facility for 72 hours. And during that 72 hours, we would um, let them rest, give them food, give them fluids, make sure they were in the best shape possible. And then if they still needed additional care, then we would transport them down to Massachusetts at that time. And just from having that 72 hours in our facility, they, um, they, we got up to 100% survival rate of, of seals surviving the journey down to, to Massachusetts. So uh, we had to then uh, wait a, a little while longer for, for the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife to give us um, uh, licenses to be able to rehabilitate the seals for as long as they need. So at this point, we're up to having space in our facility for uh, up to eight seals at a time. So that means that uh, eight seals at a time, we can provide care for as long as they need it. Sometimes that's just a couple weeks, sometimes it's many months. And so we'll talk a little bit later on about some of those different conditions that they can have that can require longer term care. Um, but we are now up to being able to provide uh, eight seals with as, as long care as they need it. So our major areas of work are, are here. So the vast majority of what we do is response. And so what response means is uh, people call us on our hotline when they see a seal stranded on a beach or you know, a, a whale or a dolphin, but the vast majority of our, our responses are to seals. 
Uh, and, and we go and monitor that animal. So not every animal that is called into us needs to be brought to our facility. Uh, sometimes they just need um, to have, you know, a quiet place to rest, have people on the beach kind of kept away from them, uh, and, and they're going to be fine on their own. We only bring animals into our facility when it's determined that they can't survive on their own. So if we do have to bring an animal into our facility, we're committing to caring for it for as long as is necessary. So we have everything in our facility to, to be able to do that for as long as the animal needs. We do quite a lot of research. Um, by which we mean we collect data on every seal that we respond to, whether or not we end up bringing back to our, our facility. Um, and by collecting data, I mean um, things in the field, just like the, you know, the, the height, or not height, the length of the animal, an estimated weight, uh, general notes on its condition. And then we also uh, collect biological samples from the animals in our care, especially if they are ill or dehydrated. Um, and all of that data we provide to, to NOAA, to the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, um, and that helps them in, in their seal conservation efforts. And then we do a lot of education as well, talking to community groups and school groups about, um, you know, things that, that they can do to, to help the, the seals and, and whales and dolphins of Maine. We cover about 2,500 miles of Maine coastline. Our area that we will respond to is from the border down in Kittery all the way up to, to Rockland. And so if any call comes in about a, a stranded animal on the beach in that zone, our volunteers are the ones who go out and, and respond to that animal. Anything north of Rockland, there's an organization in Bar Harbor called Allied Whale, and they will respond to, to those between, um, between Rockland and, and Lubeck. They're in the same position that we were a while back where uh, Allied Whale does not have their own rehab facility. So just like we would pick up whales, um, sorry, seals and transport them to University of New England back in 2012, that's what, um, that's what Allied Whale does for, for us. They'll pick up those animals and transport them to us. Uh, all, of our, um, all of our animal response team, all of our animal care team and the education volunteers um, are all uh, volunteers. We only have two full-time staff um, and like 80 volunteers. And so we're, we're almost entirely a volunteer organization. So a little bit more detail about the kind of animals we will usually respond to and, and care for. So most of our responses, most of the calls that we get and most of the cases that we go out and, um, and evaluate on the beaches are pinnipeds. And so pinnipeds is the more scientific name for, for the group of animals that are our seals and sea lions. We only have seals here in Maine. We don't have uh, sea lions on the East Coast, um, but, but it, the pinnipeds group encompasses both. So if we break down the pinniped name, the pinna part means flipper and the ped part means feet. And so you put those two together, flipper feet, and you get pinnipeds. And so that refers to you know, the, the flipper-like nature of their um, their front flippers and their back flippers that, that help them to move through the water. So here in Maine, we see four species of seals and two of those we only see here in the winter time and two of those we will see all year round. So the ones we only see in the winter are typically um, Arctic species and in the summer it's too warm here for them. In the winter, however, it's cool enough around here that um, some of them will, will migrate down and, and give birth down here. So one of the ones that we see in the winter time is the, the harp seal. And so the harp seal, you uh, have probably seen pictures of the you know, super cute little snowball seals on the ice in the Arctic. Um, they're all white and just have you know, the little black nose. Those are baby harp seals. And again, in the winter, some of the, the females will come down and, and give birth down here. They're called harp seals because as adults, they have a big black mark on their back that's kind of in the shape of a, of a harp. Um, so that's their, their adult marking. So if we take a look at the harp seal in this picture, we can see that it doesn't have the pure white coloration of a juvenile, but it doesn't have that fully developed black harp shape on its back yet. So we can tell that this is a, a juvenile harp seal. The other one we'll see occasionally in the winter time is the hooded seal. And so the hooded seal gets its name. You can see that picture on the right there with um, the, the big kind of bulbous balloon that's coming out of that hooded seal's nose. 
So that is a male hooded seal. And that is the male hooded seals um, mating display. So that's where they get their name as, as that being kind of the hood. It's a big um, sack of uh, sort of skin in their nose that they can like take a big breath and then blow out that sack. Uh, and I guess if you're a female hooded seal, that's extremely attractive because uh, that's, that's how the, the male hooded seals attract mates and, and where they get their name from. So again, that's one that we only see around here in the, in the winter time. One of our year round species is the gray seal. These are, uh, you can see these quite often up off the, the mid coast. Um, I see them all the time if I'm like, if I take the ferry out to Monhegan or if I'm kind of off coast around that mid coast area, um, they're, they like to hang out on some of the offshore rocks out there. They are easy to confuse for our other year round species, the harbor seal, but there are some ways that you can tell them apart. Um, the gray seal, the adult gray seals are a little bit bigger than the adult harbor seals. They outweigh them by about 100 pounds, 100 to 200 pounds, um, and are also maybe one to two feet longer. So um, they're a bit bigger, and they also have a much more elongated snout. So if you see one kind of in profile, their, their face is almost a little bit more like horsey looking than, um, than a harbor seal, which has a, a much more uh, shorter snout. These guys... Um, the babies we have to be particularly careful of. For some reason, the, the gray seal babies are, are particularly ornery. Um, they, they're just a little bit more likely to, um, to bite in self-defense or, or things like that. So when we're working with baby gray seals, we have to be especially careful. Uh, the, the final year-round species that we see, um, and the one that by far is in largest numbers in, in the waters of Maine is the harbor seal. So these guys are... Um, uh, Again, we can tell them apart from the gray seals. They're a little bit smaller, and they also have a, a little bit more of a blunt snout than, um, than those gray seals have. The harbor seal pupping season is in May and June. So this is when they're, they're giving birth. And so May and June is the, the busiest time for us for, for calls of people seeing seals on the beach. Um, we can tell this one is very newly born because you can actually see a little bit of its umbilical cord still attached there, like right in the middle of its belly. Um, so this is a, a brand new baby harbor seal. It is really common for people to see a baby seal on the beach um, without its mom and think that it's been abandoned or it's in trouble in some way. Um, while we always like to be called for any seal that you see so that we can assess the situation, it's, it's completely normal for the mother seal to leave her baby on the beach for three or four hours at a time so she can go off and, and hunt. The baby seal um, cannot be in the cold water for any significant length of time because it doesn't have enough of a blubber layer built up yet. Um, it needs, you know, its mother's fat rich milk in order to build up that thick blubber layer and be able to survive the cold ocean temperatures. So um, on a daily basis, the mother seal will leave her baby alone on the beach, go off to hunt and then come back and collect it. So a few things that, that are particular to, to seals that kind of affect how we care, of, care for them in, in our facility. Um, I was just talking about how baby seals can't be in the water for very long because they'll, they'll get too cold because um, they don't have that, that thick blubber layer yet. So when we have very young seals in our care, um, we have to balance between, you know, we want them to spend some time in the water because they need to learn how to swim and learn how to move around in the water, um, learn how to, you know, chase after fish in the water and that kind of thing. Um, but we can't have them in the water for too long or, or else they start to get cold. So they get kind of short chunks of, of supervised swim time. Uh, for, for as long as they need to until they're at a weight where, where they can be in the water for a little bit longer. Um, in the wild, a baby seal will only be with its mother for about a month, which doesn't seem like very long. If we think about what kind of maternal care that mammals usually provide, um, a month seems very short. Um, but in that month, the mother seal has to um, you know, get the baby up to a weight where, where it can survive on its own in the water. So lots of, of milk being provided with um, their, their milk is very high in fat. Um, and also has to, to teach the baby how to hunt. So it's a short amount of time for, for that baby to have to learn everything it needs to in order to, to survive and also to bulk up enough in order to survive. A couple of other really interesting adaptations that seals have are, are shown in this picture. So the first thing that's kind of readily uh, evident in this picture are those really long whiskers. So 
uh, a seal's whiskers are about a hundred times more sensitive than a cat's whiskers. So, so we know, you know, that, that cats have really sensitive whiskers and they use those because they're, they're nocturnal and they, they need to kind of be able to feel where they're going. Um, seals also use their, their whiskers to sense their environment. But uh, what's really amazing is that the seals whiskers are sensitive enough that what they actually use those for is to be able to sense fish swimming nearby in the water. So just the movement of the fish in the water moves the water enough that the seals whiskers can sense that. And that's how they know where in the water to, to locate the fish. Um, if you've been underwater in the ocean at all in Maine, you know that it can be, um, it can be cloudy. It can, there can be a lot of silt in the water. Um, the, the light uh, doesn't travel down that far. And so often when they're swimming, um, swimming around underwater looking for fish, they uh, are not able to, to visually see them very well. So they have to use those whiskers and, and be able to sense the movement of the fish in the water to be able to tell where they are. The other really cool thing about seals that is, uh, makes them really well adapted to, to living in the water is their nose. So you might be able to tell from this picture that the nostrils of the seal are closed. And so even though seals spend a lot of time above water and you know, significant time below water as well, their nostrils are closed by default, whereas ours you know, are, are open by default. We're above the water all the time and, and always need to breathe through our nose. When a seal is underwater hunting, even just the little bit of energy that it would be expending to be flexing its nostrils closed, they want to be able to save that energy because that's a, a muscular contraction that would take energy. So instead, they have their nose closed by default. They don't need to flex any muscles to close their nose. Instead, they need to flex their muscles to open their nose and, and be able to breathe. And so that's what we'll see them doing um, when they're above the water. Another thing you can take a look at and really easily be able to tell the difference between a seal and a sea lion, um, you'll see this little um, black mark right on the side of the, the seal's head, kind of just uh, behind its, its eye. This is the only ear structure that a seal has. A seal doesn't have any kind of external flap or any external part of the ear. It's, it's just kind of a hole in the side of its head. Um, a sea lion, on the other hand, has an external ear structure. Um, so that's one way to, to tell if you're looking to see if you're looking at a seal or a sea lion. Um, so I do need to spend a few minutes talking about cetaceans because um, they are marine mammals and we do respond to responses of stranded cetaceans. Uh, we just don't get nearly as many of these calls as, um, as for seals. So in some ways, uh, a cetacean stranding is much more difficult for, for us to respond to for a number of reasons. Um, obviously, if, if an animal needs care, we don't have the space in our facility to be able to, to care for a, a cetacean because it's much larger. Um, so, so we need to make arrangements to get it down to um, somewhere down in, in southern New England that has the capability or, or the large facilities to be able to, to handle that. Um, another major difference between cetaceans and seals is that uh, cetaceans, which are comprised a group of, of whales and dolphins and porpoises all together make up, uh, make up cetaceans. It's, it's a normal part of seal behavior to come up out of the water and spend some time on land. Um, seals have to rest on land if they want to, to rest at all, if they want to warm up at all, they need to come out and be you know, on a rock or on the beach or, or sitting on land somewhere. Um, seals can be up out of the water for as long as they need to be. They're not gonna dry out. They're not, you know, they can breathe just fine. Um, seals can be up out of the water for, for as long as they want to be. Um, and in fact, if you see a seal up out of the water, it's chosen to be there because it either needs to rest or needs to lay in, in the sun and get warm. Cetaceans on the other hand, live their entire lives in the water. And so if a cetacean is up on land, there's a problem. Um, something has happened to, to make that animal strand, whether it's um, an illness or injury to that animal or some kind of you know, external factor. Um, you know, some pretty famously, they can get confused by um, you know, sonar or any you know, other underwater noises. Um, and one of the reasons that, that it's an issue for them is uh, they have much thicker blubber layers than seals do. And so it's much easier for a cetacean to get overheated. Um, so, so that's a problem for them. And also they are much bigger and much heavier 
So especially if we get up to the size of something like a minke whale that you can see on the lower left there, um, if they are laying on the beach, um, their weight is kind of all pressing down on their internal organs. And that weight over time on their organs can really do a lot of damage. Um, and so if we see a, a cetacean up on land, it's a little bit more of a, an emergency situation. So I wanna go over a few things about sort of what are, what are the, the best procedures if you do find a stranded seal on the beach. Um, and so I, I'm gonna share at the, uh, at the end of the, the presentation, the final slide has the, the hotline, the reporting hotline on it for Marine Mammals of Maine. And so we always like to be called if you see a seal on the beach, whether it's alive or if it's not alive anymore, we still like to be called so that we can at least have that report and, and collect that data. Um, but in the meantime, you know, you, you call and then it takes a little bit of time for, for volunteer to arrive. Um, and especially if the beach is really crowded, there's a, a lot of people who are interested in what's happening with that animal um, and a lot of ways that that interaction can go wrong. So I'm um, just gonna go over kind of a, a few little list of, of do's and don'ts. Um, so when it comes to kind of how, how we want to, to lower the animal's stress, it's really important to, to keep the area immediately surrounding that animal quiet and to minimize contact between people and, and the seal. So uh, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, that's a, a federal law, um, stipulates that, that you have to be 150 feet away from any marine mammal that is up out of the water. Um, so that's kind of a good guideline for, for thinking about how far away you should be. Uh, and really seals are, are extremely prone to, to stress. Um, they, they may not, animals don't necessarily show stress in the same way that humans do. So it's not always immediately evident that that's happening, um, but, but having a lot of people around is gonna be extremely stressful for that animal. And especially if it's already um, underfed or dehydrated or ill, that extra stress can really make its condition worse. We don't wanna be returning it to the water. Um, we, we talked before about how uh, seals can be up out of the water for as long as they need to be. We see this a lot. And unfortunately, we've had a lot of reported cases of this this summer where someone will um, see a seal on the beach and think that you know something's wrong with it and it has to be brought back to the water. So these folks are, are very well-meaning. They're, they're trying to help, but often what they're doing is disturbing an animal that needs rest. Um, and, and bringing it back to the water when it's not ready to go yet. And, and really a seal um, is not gonna be harmed by, by, by being up out of the water. Um, if you're in a position to be able to, um, to inform folks around you of, of the right things to do, we always love when, when people can take that on. Uh, I wanna talk a few minutes about, um, your, about dogs specifically. We know, you know a lot of people take their dogs for, for walks on the main beaches. Um, and a dog is gonna investigate anything that's interesting, which might include a seal laying on the beach. Um, when it comes to dogs, uh, dogs and, and seals are actually fairly closely related. Like evolutionarily speaking, dogs and seals are, are pretty closely related, so much so that they can actually pass diseases back and forth. And so um, if, the, if that seal has some kind of disease, it could, um, it could be passed to your dog and, and vice versa. Um, so it's especially important to, to keep any dogs away from the animal. Don't need to be pouring water on it. Again, they're, they're not in danger of being overheated. Um, and in fact, if they're up out of the water and laying in the sun, they, it's probably because they need to get warm. Uh, I hope this one would be a no brainer, but um, you know, stranger things have happened. And, and we know that you know, sometimes people, again, with the best intentions, um, are, are trying to help if they think the seal looks a little skinny or if they just think it doesn't look super great. Um, but, but anything that is going to be human food that you have with you is, is not gonna be something that's good for it. But we do like it when you can call us right away so that we can come down and, and assess that animal's condition. Again, min, most of the time they're, they're fine, they're in good shape and, um, and, and they're, they can go on their merry way. Um, but, but we do like to check them out just in case there's, there's something that we need to address. So there's a couple things, you know, kind of showing some um, human interaction cases in, in these photos. Um, unfortunately, knowing how large and, um, and popular the beaches of Maine are, we see a lot of human interactions with the seals. Uh, so up on the upper left here, it's kind of hard to see because it's in the middle of like a cluster of people. But here in the middle of that red circle, there's a, there's a baby seal laying on the beach. 
And so, you know, we can see that there's all, all kinds of people clustered around it. Everyone's interested, everyone wants to take a look. Um, this happened on, this was on Old Orchard Beach, um, I think three summers ago. And this is a, a bad situation for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, again, we talked about how the, the seals are extremely stress prone. Um, they, they get very stressed out very easily, especially the babies who are, are small and kind of defenseless. Um, and the other issue is that we know that, we know that the, the mother seals leave the babies up on the beach while they go off to hunt. If the mother seal comes back and sees this situation, sees her baby with loads of people crowded around it, she's going to be too scared to come back in and retrieve her baby. So she's going to see this situation, be really scared, and just just leave the situation. She'll that and and that ends up being a, a maternal abandonment case. And then we have to collect that seal and bring it back because it's not going to survive without without maternal care. We don't like to do that because. Um, any animal's best chance of survival is always, you know, in the wild with its with its um, caregivers. So we, you know, it's the worst case scenario for us for sure. Um, but but this can result in maternal abandonment, and then we have to bring the seal in. Um, I mean, obviously, this person is like way too close if they're touching the seal, um, you know. And we know they're they're cute, and everyone wants a picture. Um, but again, this this is going to result in a lot of stress for this animal, which is not good for its health. Uh, on the lower left here, someone has put the seal on a boogie board to carry it back to the water. Again, um, this is not, seals never need to be returned to the water. They're, they're always just fine up on land. And then on the lower right there, uh, there's a seal that it, you can kind of see up by its head area there. There's, uh, there's some fishing line entangled or some, uh, a piece of old fishing net entangled around that animal. So even in a case like that, we prefer to uh, have you call us and, and we can respond and help that animal out rather than having um, having you do it. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is your safety. Uh, a seal, when you approach it, does not know that you are trying to help. It, it may think that you're a predator. It may think that um, it's in danger. Seals have really long and really sharp teeth. Uh, they will bite. So uh, we, we definitely like to, to make sure that whoever is helping that seal is, is in a safe situation and has the, the protective gear that they need. And the second reason, um, you know, often in a case like this, well, actually, rather than disentangle that seal from the fishing line um, on the beach, we will bring it back to our facility because chances are with that fishing line wrapped around and kind of digging into its skin, um, it may have some open wounds related to that. And so we would want to, um, to fix that in kind of a, a sterile environment and maybe give it some, some antibiotics or just make sure to keep it for a couple of days and make sure those wounds aren't gonna get infected. Um, so it's best for the seal and for, for you as, as the person who sees it um, for, for us to, to help out with that instead. So this is quite often what ends up happening when we respond to, to a seal on the beach. So this baby has, um, again, it's, its mom has gone off to hunt. It is here. And so what we will do is, you know, we get a call about it, we respond to that animal, and we'll put up a sign like this that informs anyone who might come along that, you know, this, please leave the seal alone, it's just resting, we're, we're here and we're kind of assessing the situation. So we'll put the sign, and then we retreat back to that, you know, at least 150 feet that's stipulated by the, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and we, we monitor it, we just monitor the situation for as long as we need to. Um, and, and sometimes that even includes coming back the next day. So uh, we'll monitor it either until the mom comes back and picks it up and we realize, okay, everything's great. Um, if the mom hasn't come back to pick it up in a couple of hours, again, we might go and come back the next day and, and check on it. Um, or until we determine that it has enough, you know, illnesses or injuries or dehydration um, that it, it won't survive on its own and, and we need to bring it in. But a lot of it is just, you know, a lot of watching and, and monitoring. So if we do have to bring it in, what, what happens there? So this is a, a series of photos of the same seal from on its, on its rescue date and then also on its release date. So those top two rows of pictures are the seal on its rescue date. Uh, so we can see that um, anytime the animal is being handled by our volunteers, they, they wrap a big thick towel around it. That's mainly for their protection. In addition to sharp teeth, um, seals also have really sharp claws on their front flippers. 
And so those can be, you know, those can cause injury. Uh, so we always wrap it up like a little burrito anytime that we need to be transporting it or picking it up or carrying it somewhere. Um, when we transport it back to our facility, you can see there, um, they just, you know, we use dog carriers, the same that you might put your dog in to, to take it to the vet. Um, and that they just get transported right in the volunteer's car. Um, and so again, they, they'll be with us in our care for as long as they need to be, um, you know, whether that's a couple weeks or months at a time. Uh, and, and until basically the, our vet determines that it's at a healthy weight to be released. And also it's completely free of any kind of infections or injuries or illnesses. Um, and we can see that it's perfectly able to hunt and, and eat fish on its own. When we do our releases, uh, there's a couple locations. We do a lot from Popham Beach. Um, that's kind of our, our main release location. Uh, it's just a, a good spot for them to be. There's good you know, fishing up there, good hunting for them. Um, so that's fairly typically where, where we release from. Um, if you're interested, we haven't done a lot of these uh, lately because of COVID, but um, if you follow the Facebook group, um, if you just go on the, the Marine Mammals of Maine website, the, the link is on my last slide. And then if you go from there to their Facebook group and follow their Facebook group, every once in a while, you know, a couple times a summer, they'll have a public release event, meaning they'll post the date and time that they plan on releasing the seals and they say anybody who's interested can come um, and you can go watch the seal release if, if that's something that you want to do. If it's a seal that has been in our care for a while, they'll ask all the people who are there to kind of like cheer and clap and, and make a lot of noise. Um, it seems a little bit mean. Um, we kind of want to scare the seal a little bit but we really don't want it to associate humans with you know, good things. Um, and if it's been in our care for a while, then the chances are it, it may be doing that. Um, but we really don't want it to be in a situation in the future where it's you know, willingly going up to, to humans. So I have a quick video to share with you about you know, a couple days in the life of a baby seal in our facility. So let me get that all queued up.
Okay, I needed to um, to just uh, unshare and then reshare for the for the video. Um, can folks see my? Um, can you see the PowerPoint again? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Thank you so much. Sometimes switching back and forth from a video to a PowerPoint, um, there's a little hiccup. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so I just want to share a little bit of information about our current patients. So these are the folks that we currently have in our facility that, that we're helping back to, to full health and hoping to be able to release soon. <clears throat> so we have a, a pair. Uh, they were not collected together, but they've kind of become like best friends. So uh, this is number 36 on the left and number 37 on the right. Um, they, uh, we, so I guess I should say first when I, when I refer to them by numbers, we actually do that on purpose. We give them numbers rather than names um, purely so the staff don't get too attached um, because they're very easy to get attached to. Um, and it, it helps us to just to, to refer them to the numbers that they were collected with um, just so, you know, we, we kind of keep all the records straight and, and all of that. But Number 36 on the left there was brought in from Freeport. Uh, she was born prematurely. We can tell that, um, actually, you might have noticed in the video that I just showed, uh, one of, um, or that, that baby seal who was featured in that video, um, the, the coat was like a, almost like a light yellowish or kind of cream colored coat. Um, for a harbor seal, that's an indication that the, um, the animal was born prematurely. If a, when a harbor seal is born at full term, its, um, its birth coat is already gray. Uh, so if we see a seal with that creamy yellow um, color in its coat, uh, we, that we know automatically that, that it was born prematurely. And, and we collect any premature births right away um, because they often need more care than, than the mother is capable of providing. Um, so that's that is one situation where you know we we have to bring it in um, right away, which is sometimes unfortunate. But um, in in a lot of cases, unfortunately, um, the the uh, the prematurely born seals will will be maternal abandonment cases anyway. Um, so so that was number thirty six. Uh, she was brought in from from Freeport as a premature birth, um, and then number thirty seven on the on the uh, right, she was brought in from Westport. Um, I believe is a not not necessarily a premature birth, but um, she was very emaciated and and dehydrated and and definitely would not have have survived without specialized care. These two are like best friends. Um, seals in the wild are normally solitary creatures, but um, but these guys were were actually planning on releasing them together um, because they're just kind of inseparable at at the facility. So we're hoping to be able to to release them together because they're just like best friends. Um, number 120 was a very recent case from Kennybunk. Uh, this is a, um, a, uh, a baby who you can kind of see around its mouth. Uh, it uh, it's, has a lot of kind of injuries and like little, um, little open spots around its mouth. We're not entirely sure what was going on there, um, but it was, it was very emaciated and also dehydrated. And we think whatever those mouth injuries were, were, were keeping it from being able to feed properly. So, so we did have to, to bring him in. Um, oftentimes seals that are not able to eat properly are also dehydrated. They don't really have any source of fresh water to drink. They get all their water from, from their food, from the fish that they eat. So if they're not able to eat, then they're also not able to get enough, um, enough water and they end up also dehydrated. So we, we often see those things going hand in hand, the, the emaciation and the dehydration. So this is after just a couple of days, you can see that, that it, his mouth is really starting to, to heal up quite a lot. And, and we're hoping that he'll be able to start eating on his own again and, and, and putting on weight. Um, if animals in our care aren't able to, to eat with us, we, do, um, we are able to, to tube feed them. And that's something that our, our um, care team is really well um, trained to do. They can often um, kind of get in and out with a tube feeding in 30 seconds or less. Um, so it's really, we keep it as low stress for the animal as we can. And then these two were both brought in, both brought in on the same day from Harpswell but were um, not like, you know, related in any way. They were collected from different locations in Harpswell. Um, you can really see on the lower left picture there um, kind of what their conditions are. Um, number 80 is the, the smaller one. Um, this is another 
um, another case where where uh, it was a maternal abandonment for for reasons that that we don't know. Um, but you can see that it he was very thin when he was first collected um, and and really needed to be fed up quite quite a lot. Number eighty one is is the larger looking one. Uh, it had it was over a month old. So so uh, we think that it had kind of a, a natural timeline of, of separation from from its mom. Uh, but for some reason was just not really learning how to, to hunt properly, wasn't really able to, to catch fish properly on his own because he, um, he was not in very good shape when we, we picked him up. He looks a little bit thicker now in this picture, but um, when we picked him up a couple of days before that, um, he, was, he was thinner. Um, so he's, he's going to be with us until he, uh, he learns how to hunt on his own. Um, so I'll keep this slide projected for, for just a couple minutes uh, so that you have the opportunity to write down the, the website if you want to and also the, the hotline if you want to. And, and um, I can also provide that in the chat um, when, we're, when we're doing a little Q&A so that if you want to be able to, um, to put that, like program it in your phone. I've actually, um, in, the, in the amount of time that I've been with Marine Mammals of Maine, I've myself had to call in two seals that, that I came across on the beach. Um, so I just like have this hotline number programmed into my phone as Marine Mammals of Maine. And um, so I'm, I know that I don't have to go searching for the number if I'm in a situation where, where I see the seal and, and need to call it in. Um, and then there are links to our Facebook and our Instagram on Marine Mammals of Maine. Um, if you're at all interested in, in seals and kind of knowing um, who's in our facility receiving care at any given time, I highly recommend following on Facebook and Instagram. Our social media folks are so, so good about updating, you know, three or four times a week with pictures and videos and updates on the conditions of, of all of the animals that are in our facility receiving care. So it's a good way to kind of follow along with um, with how they're doing and just kind of see um, see who we've got in it at any given time. So um, I'm going to stop my screen share at this point, but again, I'll put the the um, phone number and the website in the chat if um, if you guys are interested in um, in that and weren't able to to copy it down um, right away. So I at this point, uh, I can take any questions that folks have. Well, um, Sarah, that was just terrific. Thank you. I mean, what great work that the whole organization does. I think it's marvelous. So, and I found it very, very interesting. Oh, great. Um, thank you. So um, I, we can take questions from the floor. You could, you could unmute yourself and raise your hand or just speak out. And there are some questions in the chat as well. So, um, Maybe I'll start by going to the chat and seeing what we have there. Um, okay, so, um, I, well, I, I was very curious. So you said you feed them formula, but I'm assuming it's not the stuff that we buy in Hannaford's. So right. what does a baby seal need as its formula? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I, I unfortunately don't know all the percentages off the top of my head, um, but but basically every um, every mammal's milk has a different kind of composition of you know a certain a percentage of protein, a percentage of fat, and a percentage of you know essential nutrients, um, and so. Uh, we have to mix up basically our, our custom formula with the correct percentage of, of all the things that the animal needs. Um, and so that's, uh, that's sort of a normal procedure in, in animal care and, you know, zoos and, and stuff like that. Um, so like I said, I unfortunately don't know those percentages off the top of my head, but I know that it goes into, you know, X percent of protein gets mixed in, X percent of um, fat. It's a lot of fat. Um, seal, sea, uh, marine mammal milk in general is really high in fat because the babies need to um, build up that fat layer to, to survive the, the cold water and they need to be able to build up that fat, fat layer very quickly. Um, so it's, it's a really high percentage of fat, much more so than most uh, land mammals. Okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm sort of, ah, oh, there's a Beth Eames has her hand up, Beth. Yes. Hi, Sarah. That was very interesting. I did not know that about baby seals being left on the beach, and I probably mm -hmm. would be acting inappropriately. So thank you. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. My question is: You said you used the foundation. You were founded about ten years ago. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So um, 
Have you seen any changes in the past 10 years, an increase in rescues? Has climate change affect anything that you're seeing in trends in the past 10 years? And also second part is what have you learned from the SEALs? I mean, you say you're taking a lot of information. What, what are you learning? Yeah, that, those are both really great questions. Um, so the first one, the, the changes that we've seen, um, unfortunately the biggest change that we've seen is um, an increase in the number of human interactions. Um, so I, I alluded to this a little bit kind of throughout the, the presentation, but um, one, of, one of the biggest dangers to, to SEALs um, in, a in a state as populous as Maine and in a state whose seacoast is as popular as like a destination in, in Maine are, um, are people uh, who, who want to interact with the SEAL in some way. In some cases, you know, it is really well-meaning. They're, they're trying to help, but they're actually kind of making things worse. Um, in some cases, um, there's, there's one uh, individual who uh, repeatedly has, um, has removed a seal from the beach and put it in her bathtub because she wants a pet seal. Um, so like we, we are really combating a lot of, of human interactions. And it just seems like every year there's, there's kind of more and more reports of seals that ultimately need to be brought in and, and cared for by us because of their interactions with humans. Um, a, a fairly typical example is, um, you know, folks think that, that seals need to be brought back to the water. So we'll get reports of the same seal being brought back to the water four times or five times or six times. And all the while it's just getting more and more tired because it's coming up out of the water to rest. Um, and so by the time we get it, it's in a state of exhaustion that's so bad that, that we need to take it in and care for it. Um, so, so unfortunately, the, the biggest um, change that we've seen over that time um, is as you know, Maine be, continues to grow in popularity as a vacation destination and the you know, people all over the beaches in the summertime um, is, is the number of human interaction cases. Um, and then when it comes to kind of what we learn from the SEALs, uh, you know, a lot of our um, a lot of our data goes into kind of um, baseline research. So things like um, you know, on in any given year, what's the general health of the the seal population? Um, are we seeing more animals than average that are um, you know not not as well fed? You know, have a lower percentage of blood fat. Are we seeing more animals in general that have some kind of infection? Um, it was actually our data that helped the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration um, identify that you know, the, there was a, a mass mortality event of seals uh, three summers ago, um, and it was ultimately diagnosed as a distemper outbreak. Um, and it was, it was the data that we collected from the deceased seals that we would find on the beach and, and provided to NOAA um, that ultimately allowed them to, to diagnose that as a distemper outbreak. Um, so a lot of it is just kind of um, population level health monitoring. Um, thank you, Sarah. Um, do we have uh, other questions from the people live here on the call? Well, I have, I have another question. <laughs> um, most of the examples you've given us are baby seals. Mm -hmm. um, so what about, do you get a lot of cases of seals with um, injuries from I don't know, boat propellers or nets or, or for that matter, natural causes, but adult seals, or is it, is it really pretty much entirely baby seals? Yeah, so um, the, the majority of what we get reported to are, are the babies. And that's sort of for the, the, the fairly simple fact of babies um, are spending a lot more time up out of the water than the adults. Um, so they're the ones that people see and, and the ones that people call us about. Um, you know, we, we do, we know that adult seals need to come up out of the water to, to rest and to sun occasionally, but adult seals can also spend um, many days at a time out, you know, in the open ocean without coming up on land to, to rest. So typically an adult seal, we would only see um, injured or ill on the beach if it was injured close enough to shore to be able to like swim up and get up on, on, on the shore. So um, un unfortunately, if we do see a, a seal with some kind of like boat strike injury, um, it's, it's already deceased and it's just kind of washed up um, because it, you know, that happens out in the open ocean and they don't, you know, they can't make it back to shore basically. Um, so it, we do mostly see baby seals just for the, the reason that they, they spend most of their time on land anyway. Um, but we will occasionally see, we actually had, um, Early this summer, 
we had a case of a, um, a juvenile seal. So one that was born last year. So it's not like a, uh, they're usually full adults at two or three years old. So it was kind of a, a teenager seal um, this year that for whatever reason just was, you know, we, it was counted as kind of a failure to thrive case. And um, it, it just wasn't, it was like smaller than it should have, should be for its age. Um, it was observed to like not really be eating that much in the wild. So we just brought it in and, and tried to assess its situation. I think it was with us for about a month or so. We kind of fattened it up, um, taught it how to hunt a little bit better and then we're able to release it. So generally if we see anything that is, um, that is not a baby, it's sort of like you, okay, there's an occasional you know, entanglement case, um, but, but for the most part, anything that would befall an adult seal, um, they just end up you know, deceased before they can make it back to land. I see. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, as a question from Beth. Yes, Beth, I was wondering you. if you could talk a little bit about your volunteer program. Is it pretty intensive? Does everybody get to do it? And also, do you need volunteers? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, if you do, there's a, there's a, uh, on the website, there's like a ways to get involved. And then there's a little volunteer link. Um, so if you're at all interested, I, I encourage you to fill out the volunteer interest form. That's how I got involved. I just, I just filled out the form on the website. Um, so what they do is, uh, you might not hear from them for a while. So I, I filled out the volunteer form and then I didn't hear from them for a while. And I kind of thought, okay, maybe they don't need people. But what they do is about every six months, they have a big um, info session at their facility for everyone who has signed up to volunteer in that time period. So um, they'll have a, a, an info session at the facility, um, kind of tell you a lot more detail about um, you know, the different volunteer roles and kind of what each one um, entails and and you know a lot more about kind of the ins and outs and nuts and bolts of the organization. Um, I hate, unfortunately, what happens is that everyone wants to be the one to take care of the baby seals, right? Everyone wants to be the one who's feeding them and going and picking them up from the beach and bringing them back. And like everyone wants kind of the, the hands-on experience with the seals. Um, but that's you know that's a, a small portion of, of what we need. And so uh, often when people realize that there's not any direct animal care positions open, they just kind of leave and, and are not interested anymore. Um, so I would say your best bet in getting involved is being willing and open to, to help out with, with other things. Uh, and um, you know, you can, after, after you've been with the organization for a while, um, you know, there, there may be additional opportunities. Um, they like, and I, I, this makes all the sense in the world. Um, if they're if they're having folks who are directly caring for the animals, they they sort of like to get to know you first, and you know, make sure you're reliable. Um, I've been volunteering with Marine Mammals of Maine for for three or four years, and um, I was just asked if I wanted to to start to kind of be on the animal care team a little bit. So um, there's you know there's ways to get involved if you're willing to to do stuff that's um, maybe not directly feeding seals immediately. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I've got two great questions just come in in the chat from Alex, who, and Alex, I think is eight. I'm hoping I've got that right. And okay. he asks, I don't know if Alex could be a he or a she, Alex. I'm very sorry if I got that wrong. Um, how could you help a baby seal to feed if their mouth is injured and they're underweight? Is there a chance for the baby seal's survival? And the second question is, what is a seal's life expectancy? Great questions, both. Um, so the first one, yes, there is absolutely a chance for their survival. Um, so we can tube feed. So when we do a tube feeding, there's a, we have kind of a, a very flexible, soft length of tube. Um, and what we can do is um, take the seal, we kind of wrap it up like a little burrito in a, in a towel so that it can't move around very much. Um, we know how much, you know, how many inches of tube to put in. Um, and so we can basically put the, the tube right down into its stomach and just put the formula right down in, into its stomach through, um, through that tube. And so in that way, we're able to get it all the nutrition that it needs without it having to, to use its injured mouth in order to, to chew. Um, and we do, our volunteers are like very well practiced at doing the tube feeding. So um, it's not like painful for the animal it takes 30 seconds and then it's, it's over and they have a full belly and so, and so they're happy. So yes, even with an animal that is injured, um, has some injuries to its mouth parts, 
we can um, we can still feed it, and and once its mouth is healed, it will be able to, to eat on its own. And so um, we fully anticipate that 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 seal with mouth injuries will will be able to heal up just fine. That's and great. then question number two about the the life expectancy um, in the wild, it, their life expectancy is um, is about twenty years. So um, they they can live quite a long time. Poor seal. Thank you very much. Well, I hate to say it, but our time is up. This oh has dear. been okay. really great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Before everyone goes, I just want to, to um, make sure to tell you what else is coming up in our summer speaker series. So next week on the 29th, we have Emily Sano, who um, is the director of the um, San Antonio Art Museum and lives here in Lovell a lot of the year. And she's going to talk about behind the scenes, a day in the life of an art museum. And the following week, August the 5th, Peter Ellison, who is a Harvard anthropologist and also lives here in Lovell a lot of the year, is going to talk about an evolutionary perspective on COVID-19. And both those talks, our current plan is they're hybrid talks. You can attend them in person in the library or you can go attend them on Zoom. It's entirely up to you, should be both. So going back to Sarah, Sarah, thank you. I mean, what a, what a great introduction to the work that the organization does. And I'm so glad you exist. And I'm sure your website has a place for donations if people would like to donate. Yes, so the, the donation found, button is front and center. <laughs> absolutely, good. So if you have found their work inspiring, as I did, then go and donate. And uh, many thanks, Sarah. All right, okay. thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it.